Hey, welcome to another edition of Labor Vision Podcast. I'm your host, James Dennis, American Workers First, and Labor Vision presents the 2020 Vision for Labor. The goal is to engage, educate, and energize. New podcasts and YouTube video every Friday. Like, share, and subscribe. I'm here with my co-host, Charles Daniels. What's up, Charles? Hello, hello. Hey. Good to see you. Great to be here. And he is president of CWA Local 4123. And we have our special guest today, Mr. Rick Michaels. What's up? A lot. How you doing? Pretty good. You got two first names. Uh, yeah, yeah. So do I, James Dennis. Exactly. Good stuff. <laughs> Wait a minute. One more thing. Charles Daniels. You yeah. dropped the Charles, S off of there. Yeah. Charles yeah. Daniels. Right there. Yeah. Charles yeah. Daniels. Yeah. I'm right. close. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Good, good, good. I'm great. So what's the good word, fellas? I'll tell you what. This gentleman right here um, I have stolen from shamelessly because we are on Unanimous Radio, <laughs> and you threw out a quote uh, relating to those who are not engaged in politics, but politics still caring about them. Do you want to toss that out? Because it's one of my absolute favorite quotes of all time as far as the Pericles quote. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pericles, uh, ancient Greek uh, uh, philosopher, politician, said that uh, uh, you might not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. Ooh, yes. good one. someone's got an agenda for you out there and knowledge is power. And if you're not being educated when it comes to the voting, someone is going to be taking advantage of you. So that's what this is all about. That's right. That's right. So what you got for us, um, Rick? Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the history of the Democratic Party and, and also where labor is uh, junctures with that. Um, I talk to a lot of folks, uh, some Republican, that um, tell me that... Um, They'll throw out, oh, we're the party of Lincoln, and the, uh, the Democratic Party has got a history of, uh, you know, terrible things. Um, and, and that's all true if you want to go back, you know, 50 or more than 50, but 100, 150 years ago. But obviously, things have changed a lot. Right. Uh, the parties have changed a lot. Right. And for someone to attack the Democratic Party about something that happened 150 years ago, while well, at the same time, they're wrapping themselves in Abraham Lincoln, uh, which to today, there's no way Abraham Lincoln could get the Republican nomination. Uh, it's just, it's disingenuous at best. And Rick, you know what? Um, on, in today's podcast, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, me and Rick had lunch not too long ago. And man, you gave up some really, really good information. And just to the audience out there, if I'm a little quiet on this podcast, it's because I'm just soaking up like a sponge. So I'm just letting you know, Rick, it isn't anything, you know, I ain't angry or mad. I'm just sitting here. So because when we had lunch the other day, we was breaking down the differences between Republican and Democrat and how each party had um, liberal people and conservative people. And now it's just all, you know, just just. Go ahead, man. Go into your spiel. You, well, you did good. it's best to think of it in terms of conservative versus progressive as opposed to Republican versus Democrat. Uh, well, I mean, you know, because the thing is, is everybody, everybody stands for party, right? It's just right. like I'm a Republican. I'm, I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican until I die. And it doesn't matter what this president does. They're going to still stand behind him because he's Republican. And it's got to be country before party, not party before country. Vote your own best interest. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. If, if, you, if you look at things, and there's a lot of very important issues that are out there. I mean, look, um, a abortion, immigration, security, I, all of those things, they're very important. But this is the Labor Vision podcast. And right. the most important thing to me is that I have a job where I can provide for my family so that my kids can go to college and have a better life. So if that is under attack, that's number one with a bullet for me. That's the most important thing by far. And whether you like it or not, there's there's a party that believes that you work from the, the, the worker up, and there's a party that believes that you give all of the money to the people at the top, and that money triples, trickles down, supply-side economics. And if you look at the aggregate data over the past 50 almost years, it just isn't working, and it hasn't worked over and over again. So what's the definition of insanity? Doing, Doing same something thing over, over and over again. again. Expecting Expecting a different and result. and yeah. to your point, you know, Labor Vision Podcast and American Workers First, those two titles right there were for labor, and we're for American workers. Yeah. You know, everyone American should be against should offshore. Be everyone exactly. should be against federal contracts going for right. companies that are getting rid of American jobs. That's right. That's just no nonsense, common sense sort of thing. And the fact that that's been made partisan politics. Right. I don't understand that. I don't know how we've allowed that to happen as a society. And it's because they pit us against each other in these very trivial 
I say trivial. They put us against each other <laughs> in these other issues. Yes. And then for some reason, it's like, well, this is my team over here as opposed to this is my government because we're a government of the people. So we're supposed right. to be working together on this to form a more perfect union. That's yes. what the founding fathers wanted, a more perfect union. Union. So we should always be striving to betterment. For me, that's what progressive politics is about. Absolutely. Incremental improvement. Progressive shouldn't be, a, uh, be used in the pejorative sense. It's not a bad word. Right, right. Well, early on, the original conservatives, if you will, were the Democrats. And the original progressives under Abraham Lincoln were the Republicans. You know, in 1860, the Republican Party formed out of the wreckage of the Whig Party. Um, everyone remembers the Whigs, right? Yep, the Whig but, Party. Uh, the, they had actually torn themselves apart over the issue of slavery. And the, wow. the, the Northern Whigs ended up, out of that wreckage, ended up forming the uh, Republican Party. And then, they, they, of course, they nominated Lincoln, and Lincoln won. In the meantime, the, the, the Democrats positioned themselves as the states' rights party. Uh, and of course their hypocrisy no, knows no bound or knew no bounds at the time, uh, because their definition of state rights was the, included the right to own other human beings. And they had no problem whatsoever with, uh, trampling all over states' rights when it came to their property rights and in, in forcing other states to return escaped slaves to servitude and, and bondage. So, uh, you know, as a result of Abraham Lincoln's victory, the Confederacy uh, was formed. And that was formed from all, it was all Democrat-controlled states that initially uh, formed the Confederacy. And um, anyway, moving forward from the Civil War, it's interesting to see the evolution of the two parties and how they supported states' rights. Uh, for example, in uh, 1865, all Republicans and only 23% of Democrats voted to uh, abolish the, uh, the, uh, uh, the institution of slavery uh, with the uh, 13th Amendment. Uh, and then here in 1868, 94% of Republicans voted to free the slaves, uh, or voted, I'm sorry, to give the freed slaves citizenship with the 14th Amendment. No Democrats did so. In 1870, giving freed slaves the vote with the 15th Amendment was passed 100% Republican, and zero percent Democrat. Wow. So, I'm familiar with what's happening nowadays. Yeah. Well, that's so. That's where we started from. In that, in, in, in the you know the the progressives being the Republicans and the conservatives being the Democrats. Mm. But by 1964, support for the Civil Rights Act was much closer. Eighty percent of uh, Republic, House Republicans and sixty three percent of House Democrats. Uh, supported uh, the Civil Rights Act. In wow, okay. 1965, the Voting Rights Act, 84% Republican support versus 71% Democrats. Hmm, okay. So uh, the way the Republicans and Democrats um, voted at that point in the mid-60s um, had come together so much that, you know, Alabama Governor uh, George Wallace famously said, there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Democrat and Republican Party. Right. Now, when he said that, that was true at that time. Mm -hmm. If you say it now, it just tells me that you obviously aren't paying attention to what's going on. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, the polls were starting to flip then. They've flipped now. Yeah. So um, let's take a look at, uh, you know, some of the changes that occurred in that 100-year period between 1865 and 1965. I think the first big change to my mind was uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, mm -hmm. He got elected. Uh, he brought, or he when he became president, he brought uh, 44 antitrust suits against the big uh, companies, including Standard Oil. Now compare that with uh, his three predecessors combined, only brought 18 antitrust suits against big companies total in all those years. So he was trying so, to regulate those companies. Well, uh, or even bust the trust, break them up. Like Standard Oil, he actually broke them up. The, the, uh, one of the oil trusts, or I'm sorry, not the oil, one of the railroad trusts he broke up as well. Um, a lot of them, he would just regulate them. Oh, so monopolies okay. are bad. Yes. Okay. They're bad for the consumer. They're bad for people. So he was also the first president ever to settle a labor dispute. Uh, it was the 1902 anthracite uh, coal mine strike. And uh, he, uh, he regulated the railroads. He successfully pushed for the Meat Inspection Act and the Pure Food and Drug Act. Which uh, all that is probably gone now under this new president? Well, it, <laughs> it, I guess it survives de jure, if not de facto. But, uh, oh, uh, Go he, ahead. I'm he, sorry, yeah, my brother. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he established the, uh, the United States Post, or I'm sorry, Forest Service, created five national parks. Had, uh, he had the first black man to the White House for dinner, George Washington Carver. Very progressive. Uh, yeah, but for the time, yeah, he received an, an immense amount of 
of very hateful attacks from racist whites just for having a man to dinner in the White House. It was, right. uh, and, and not just a man, a great man. I mean, George Washington Carver. I mean, he's like yeah, invented he a bunch of yeah. stuff. Exactly. I mean, a legend, absolutely. So, An icon. But anyway, he proclaimed uh, uh, 18 U.S. national monuments, 51 bird reserves, four game reserves, 150 national forest, um, and he got the first workman's comp laws passed. So, so wait a minute. So he, that's more closer to socialism? Those are social programs. Right, exactly. And, 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 that, and what party was and he environmentalism? in? Environmentalism? He was yeah. a Republican. So... Oh, man, come on, dude. We're... But, but, but wait, wait. But, but then something more. happened. <laughs> There's something happened. His successor, William Howard Taft, uh, despite his the promises that he had made, uh, once he became president, immediately began to reverse all of Teddy Roosevelt's progressive Oh, that policies. sounds familiar. So the, at that point, uh, Teddy ran against him four years later, and, uh, and even though he received more votes in Republican primaries and caucuses, than William Howard Taft in. There was no law that said that the party had to honor those votes, so they just went ahead and gave the incumbent Taft the nomination anyway. So Curious that, democracy. Yeah, so at that oh, point, boy. Um, he formed uh, the 1912 Progressive Party. So there we go. Uh, the, uh, the, the Republicans weren't progressive enough, so Teddy Roosevelt formed a progressive party, a.k.a. Bull Moose Party. And uh, as a result of that election, uh, Teddy Roosevelt achieved uh, or received more votes than any other third party candidate in American history. Uh, he, by the way, he took Michigan as well. Wow. So, uh, the Woodrow Wilson took forty two percent of the vote, which was a plurality plurality plurality, plurality of the yeah. vote. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, You're just like me, man. Yeah, with but these because, words, right? Because the Republican vote was split, that that was enough. Yeah. The uh, the incumbent William Howard Taft, only time in world or, or American history uh, for an incumbent president, he took a distant third. Uh, the, wow. The, the the thing is though. Uh, Oh, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. No, does it say come um, up just a little bit? Yeah, there you go. So, uh, as a result of this election, the the progressives were absorbed by the Northern Democrats. So they left the Republican Party and and went into the Democratic Party because the so, ideals kind of started to switch. Yes, they right. To, they to right. flip flop. So started. what what made sense at one point is like, wait a second, this party is no longer representing my ideals of how America is supposed to function. Right. So I'm going to move to a, a group that that does. Well, yeah, and it was a start because you know Woodrow Wilson was an avowed racist. That's that's a historical fact. Right. Uh, and the the racist of the South, the Southern Democrats, um, they weren't any less racist than they had been. But it was it was a step towards progressive reform of the Democrats, and it was a step closer to the conservatism uh, and the of of the right now. So, in that's that's fully encapsulated in the Republican Party. Uh, now, Teddy Roosevelt's cousin, later on, flat, fast forward a little bit, was his fifth cousin by blood, and it was his nephew by marriage. And actually, uh, Teddy Roosevelt gave away the bride, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Really? I did because, not know that. Yeah, because his uh, Teddy Roosevelt's brother, Kermit, had died, and Kermit was Eleanor's father. So he stood in as father of the bride ah, uh, okay. so for his brother. So she was his, she was his niece. And uh, and they and like I said, and him and um and and Fr and Franklin Roosevelt were distant cousins. Okay. But Eleanor was the first activist first lady. She championed equal rights and racial justice. Uh, in June of 1941, Franklin issued a very little little known executive order 8802, creating the Fair Employment Practices Committee. Now this was the most important federal move in support of civil rights for African Americans since Reconstruction. And it, and it stood as that until the 1964 Civil Rights Act as being the most important. Okay. Uh, this was a, re a result of A. Philip Randolph, who was a African American trade unionist, urging um, uh, he, urging Roosevelt to do this, along with NAACP and Urban League leadership, which at that point was supporting Roosevelt against the, his Republican opponents. So um, now Roosevelt created the National Labor Relations Board. Yay. Um, and the Fair Labor Standards Act. Both set minimum oh, Yeah, both set minimum wages and a maximum work week, 40 hours. So all, you know, it was also known as the the Wagner Act or the National Labor Relations Act of 1935. Now, you can go into some details and uh, which I don't want to 
bog us down with, uh, then it got re basically reaffirmed in 1938. But within 10 years of that 1935 uh, act being, Wagner Act being passed, 35% of non-union, I'm sorry, non-farm workers were union. That was the peak wow. uh, of union uh, membership. Oh, you're right. And that right. was in the you're wake right. of the Great Depression, yes. right? Yeah. After things had crashed in uh, 29 through yes. the floor, you know, they have the Dust Bowl, people are really struggling. And how do we fix that? We start empowering the people right. and you build from the bottom up. Well, yeah, and it never uh, went higher than 35%. Well, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I think we had total numbers peaked in like 1970 or something, or 79, mm-hmm. something like that. Yep. But I'm, I'd have to look it up. But the percentage of the workforce, non-farm workforce, 35%, that was the peak. Yep. Um, not, uh, But also wages had increased in that 10-year period, oh, yeah. 65%. And unemployment was less than 1%. I mean, that's just crazy idea of in a, in a decade, 65% increase in your wages. You're looking at the past 40 years of current history and wages haven't even kept up with inflation. I mean, it's not even close. So to to see those huge gains that were got in the past coming from labor, coming from the union movement, I mean, that's big. And you say 35%, but also realize the companies that were not organized, they had to compete with those organized companies. So if they didn't have wages that were comparable, if they didn't have benefits that were comparable, if they weren't treating their workers as well, well, kick rocks. They're going to go somewhere else, and they're going to find a place that, that treats them better. So but less isn't than that, 1% uh, unemployment, you know, then the labor yeah. is in the driver's seat. But isn't that the same thing that's going on today as far as the wages? So you got a Toyota plant or a Honda plant. They're not organized. Why? Because they're giving the same wages as the big three that is organized. Because the moment they drop below that industry standard, what's going to happen? So the unions going are to get setting organized. the standard. Absolutely. So even non-union workers benefit from the power of union. Absolutely. After, and then if you look at the figures of when unions is is, is big and well, the nation's big and well. well the, we, the, figures, we, the figures are showing, are saying it for themselves. Well, we certainly haven't had a 65% increase in wages over the la- these last 10 years or the last 20 or the last 30. In fact, that quite the opposite. They've stagnated. While profits for large corporations and uh, rich folks <laughs> have skyrocketed. It threw I mean, the just, roof. Yeah, right through the stratosphere, uh, worker wages have stayed flat despite massive increases in productivity. Exactly. And, and, and then, so you know what, Rick, we were talking about something at lunch. Um, and I think it was what do we need to do to kind of right side this today? Remember, well, you, you were, you well, were talking about that. that? But I, okay. I kinda, you're, you're getting ahead of me. I kind of want to, okay. you know, finish with the history only because, you know, in order for us to move forward, we need to know, know where we're at, and we need, to know, we need to know how we got there. And so many of us take so much for granted uh, and have no clue as to what well, we have for. Got you, got you. And, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so let's That's take true. a minute to at least know who those giants were and and some of the the, the actions that they, they did, the accomplishments that they made, to allow us to be sitting here doing this podcast right now. Through tremendous so sacrifice. Yes, tremendous absolutely. sacrifice. Absolutely. So, okay, go so ahead, my brother. After Roosevelt died, um, you know, Harry Truman integrated the military in 1948. He also included for the first time a call for civil rights in the Democratic Party platform. At that point, 35 Dem- Dixiecrats uh, walked out of the convention and they formed their own states' rights um, Democrats, uh, Democratic ticket. They won four states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So that's almost like a, a repeat of the Tea Party, what they did with the Republican Party. Well, I guess you could say the Tea Party might have been repeating what Well, yeah, the no, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yes, that, so, that, the Tea Party repeated them. Wow, so, that's interesting. You're right. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. So, Go ahead. So they, they, they were led by Strom Thurmond. Uh, and then, but, you know, funny thing is, is in 1964, despite being badly defeated nationwide, Barry Goldwater won the same four seats uh, for, for the Republicans. Uh, and then right after LBJ, who beat him, signed the Civil Rights Act, then Strom Thurmond left the Democratic Party and joined the Republican Party. So now we're seeing some real movement wow. here. Uh, the, His uh, ideals were no longer represented <laughs> by that party. <laughs> yeah, so, so piece by piece, step by step, this 100 years of slow change set the stage for a much more rapid shift moving forward in the mid sixties. Right. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the shift, uh, of the party establishment or uh, party alignment, um, and the eventual flipping of the polls started happening in a big way right here. 
uh, you know, and that to what we have today, which is basically conservative Republicans and progressive Democrats. Right. Uh, LBJ once said, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on, and he'll empty his pockets for you. So between them, you know, between them, Richard Nixon with his Southern strategy and George Wallace, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, that George Wallace, uh, they won every former Confederate state except for Texas in 1968. Uh, LBJ was from Texas. That was his home state. So that's, that's why they, that state Democrat. But um, Nixon had a political strategist by the name of Kevin Phillips. And in a 1970 New York Times article, he gave an interview and he actually had the audacity just to just to lay it out there. And I'm going to go ahead and quote him. He says, from now on, the Republicans are never going to get more than 10 to 20 percent of the Negro vote. And they don't need more than that. The more Negroes you register as Democrats in the South, the sooner the Negrophobe whites well, quit the Democrats and become Republicans. That's where the votes are. Without the prodding from blacks, the whites will backslide into their old, comfortable arrangement with local Democrats. So it's like, wow, uh, there wow. it is. So, I mean, not even trying to hide it. New York Times, you know, go no ahead shame. and just say it out loud. So as a result of 1964, 1968, 1972 presidential elections, the the Republican Party was viewed as the vehicle of white supremacy in the South. So, not surprisingly, they started having a hard time of getting black people to keep voting for them like they had since the Civil War. Sure. So, and it, it's funny that, uh, you know, I mean, I could sit here and say all this, and you can say, oh, he's a Democrat now. But let me just uh, mention that uh, in 2005, the RNC chair, Ken Melman, apologized to the NAACP for exploiting racial polarization to win elections and ignoring the black vote. 2005, wow. ni- 1970, not 1930, not um, two, 2005. Yeah, so um, I think I think he, he he was being cynical. I think that he had already gotten all the racist white votes. So at that point, it's like, what the heck? Might as well go for the black votes. Huh? You know, the ones that, that we drove away. 80-20 rule, right? You put yeah. all your time to that 80%, and hey, forget the 20% right there. Yeah. Not going to win them anyway. Right. But moving forward, 1980, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan in in. Uh, Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi gave a speech where he said, I believe in states' rights. So there we go. Okay. That's like, there's that code talk. Right. And um, uh, it was said that Reagan showed that he could use coded language with the best of them, lambasting welfare queens with large uh, with a large house and a Cadillac using multiple names to collect over $150,000 in tax-free income. And, of course, there was the man using food stamp who Reagan referred to as a strapping young buck. So, again, code talk. He wasn't, but it was kind of obvious. Right. Cl- close your eyes and what color is the person that he's talking about? It's yeah. just, it's overt racism without saying it. So wasn't he like um, the guy, what's his name, um, Lee Atwater? Lee Atwater was uh, with, uh, yeah, yeah, he was one of the big uh Yeah, because Lee was saying we can't yeah. say, we can't use the N-word no more. Yeah. We have to use, you code know, words. code. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, well, in 1988, George Bush's campaign successfully built on that Southern strategy with a Willie Horton attack, the attack ads mm. against Michael Dukakis. This showed conservative whites with traditional values that they were best represented by Republicans. Well, wow. today, there are no conservative Democrats to speak of. And there are no liberal Republicans or even moderate Republicans. You know, the days of William Milliken are over. Uh, Nowadays, the only way a Democrat can win a statewide race in the Deep South is if he's running against a pedophile. So, um, Alabama. (sighs) Yeah, thank you. So, um, so both. And that was, it wasn't like that was. So a, a huge landfall victory. I, no, it was, was not that a was landfall. A that, yeah, it was yeah. a squeaker yeah. for a pedophile. Yeah. Uh, yes. For a pedophile. Just think about that for a second. So both parties used to be a mix of progressive <sighs> and conservatives, Dang racist, uh, liberal, pro-worker, big business. Now they're starkly contrasted, distinctly different, with much more than a dime's worth of difference between them. Uh, the uh, Not long ago, Republicans said to me, that now this is where I'm getting into my my vision for 
Labor 2020. So if we want to have a separation here. Well, let's have a separation here because, you know, like I said, you had said something to me at lunch about what the Democratic Party needs to do. Right. Um, can, can you kind of repeat that for our, pod, sure. for our yeah. listeners, please? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to segue into it right here. OK, so, so I'll tell you what, let's do this. What is your 2020 vision for labor? Hmm, let me think about it. Oh, I don't know. No, seriously. Um, not long ago, a Republican said to me that Democrats aren't doing enough to protect the labor movement and labor unions. And I agree with him. I says that Democrats need to do a lot more to protect uh, workers and their unions. Uh, but I said that unlike Republicans, Democrats were not doing everything in their power to destroy the unions. Uh, and he did agree that I was right about that. <laughs> so what else can we do? What else should we do? What else must we do? Uh, well, for starters, let's repeal the right to work for less. Uh, let's stop the race to the bottom. Let's reinstitute prevailing wage, and let's raise the minimum wage. Stop offshoring, outsourcing, um, and uh, eliminate the tax incentives the federal government provide to corporations that shut down American production and move it overseas. To me, it's unbelievable and insane that this is the existing tax policy of the federal government, but it is. So when companies ruthlessly and relentlessly cut costs for the sake of next quarter's earnings report, you know that they are, are looking at the tax aspects of this as well quite hard. So we need more employee-owned businesses. Uh, why is it that vulture capitalists, oh, I'm sorry, I mean private <laughs> equity companies, can use other people's money to do leverage buyouts uh, then saddle them with the debt, siphon off their pensions, sell their assets, bankrupt the husk, and then walk away with all the profits. Why can't we figure out a way for employees to buy these companies and protect these jobs? So, I mean, to me, that's... I, anyway, um, so, so we need to stop privatizing public services. Private sector does not care about the service. They only care about the profits they can extract by turning good-paying jobs into low-paying jobs. When the Rockefellers and the Mellons and the Vanderbilts and other titans of industry attack unions with thugs, scabs, police, and soldiers, unions fought back and won. Unions won the right to organize, to safe working conditions, to a living wage, a 40-hour work week, health care, a pension, vacation, holidays, sick days, and a chance for our families to achieve the American dream. We need to start fighting back like we used to. We need to start fighting back and winning. Well, I think that is, that gives some applause here, right? So that's my vision. <laughs> Rick, thanks a lot, my brother. Hey, great podcast. As Absolutely. usual. Rick, you going to come back? Please. I oh, that. we're going to bring you back. Tell me what I need to talk about next time. All right. <laughs> Anything you want to talk about. Right, that's right. Coming on. Charles? That's great knowledge. Good. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to point out that uh, talking about what what happened in the uh, the times of slavery during the Civil War, the argument back then is we the main argument we, we cannot free these slaves because our we, we cannot function without them. We'll we'll be bankrupt without them. It won't work. The system will be broken. It's the same thing that they're talking about now with raising minimum wages. It's the exact same argument, and it is a fallacy. It is a misnomer. It is demagoguery. It is people telling you things to scare you because they don't want to lose what they have, not because they don't want you to lose what you have. Because in the reality is you have nothing in comparison to what they have. So stop listening to people that are just serving their best interest. They don't represent you. Start demanding they represent you. All right. Amen, brother. <laughs> Again, thank you for being at another episode of Labor Vision and American Workers First 2020 Vision for Labor. We are out. Take care. See you next time.